Welcome to our service for today, our virtual service for today. We're looking forward to the day when we can all be back together again in our churches. But for now, we'll give thanks for technology. And so we begin our worship today. We say together, Dear Lord, we thank you for your presence with us, wherever we may be. Help us to know and feel your presence, that our lives may be filled with your grace and love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We pause for a moment before making our confession to God. And so let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness for all the wrong things we have done. In your mercy, forgive us, O God. For forgetting what we ought to have remembered, for failing to do as we promised, for turning away when we should have listened, for being careless when we should have concentrated. In your mercy, forgive us, O God. For doing things we knew would annoy, for acting in ways we knew would hurt, for behaving in ways we knew would disappoint. In your mercy, forgive us, O God. O God, when we look back, we see how foolish and wrong we have been. Forgive us and help us not to do the same again. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We keep a moment of silence before we say the collect together. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Pour your love into our hearts and draw us to yourself and so bring us at the last to your heavenly city where we shall see you face to face. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Our Bible reading today comes from Matthew, chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Jesus said, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner, who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parables, they realised that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds, because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. The theme for this address today is Jesus never gives up on us. Jesus never gives up on us. I wonder, when you were a child, did your parents ever go on and on at you about something? Did they fall into the trap of nagging? For those of us who are parents, have we ever fallen into that same trap? If a child, or a friend for that matter, continually does something that we'd rather they didn't, do we keep going on and on about it, hoping that one day they're going to listen and understand what it is that we're trying to say? Our daughters-in-law are constantly telling off the children for time spent on iPads, and sometimes they actually confiscate the iPad so they can't spend any more time on them. They only want the best for them. That's what they say. And I suppose there's quite a lot of that in our Gospel reading today. In it, Jesus addresses the chief priests, the Pharisees and the elders of the people. They are in the temple and we pick up the story at yet another confrontation. The chief priests, Pharisees and elders wanted to know by what authority Jesus was addressing them. After all, it's they who are the senior members in the temple, not him. Jesus used the example of the vineyard and the tenants to address their point. It's widely understood that the parable is an illustration of God and the people of Israel. God is the landowner and the people of Israel are the tenants. In short, the parable tells us that having worked really hard on the land, the tenants wanted to keep all the fruit for themselves. They neither wanted to share it or give anything back to the landowner. In fact, they killed all who came to collect any Jews, including the landowner's son. Regardless of what we might think about the Pharisees, you have to give them credit, you know, because they got it. They understood the parable. They heard what Jesus was saying. They realised that he was talking about them. They didn't like what they heard, of course, and they wanted to put a stop to it. And they wanted him gone. Well, I think it's fair to say that if there's anyone with whom we have had a confrontation or a falling out, God forbid, we tend to avoid them, but not Jesus. Time after time, the Gospels record his confrontations. Jesus just keeps on coming at them, regularly offending, confronting and aggravating the leaders of the temple. He doesn't mince his words, often coming straight to the point. But if we look at it from the Pharisees' point of view, Jesus will never give them a direct answer to their questions, a bit like a politician. Jesus ate with the wrong sort of people. Jesus taunted them by breaking the law, and I'm talking about their laws, not God's. Jesus healed on the Sabbath. He called them hypocrites. He called them blind leaders. He continually escaped the traps that they laid for him, often leaving them speechless. In fact, I suppose from the amount of confrontations we read of in the Bible, Jesus could be classed as the perfect example of a nagbag. The chief priests, Pharisees and elders just can't catch a break with Jesus because he never lets up. Why? What's that all about, I wonder? Does Jesus keep going on at them because he wants to write them off? But surely that's not the Jesus that we know and love. I mentioned earlier about my daughters-in-law and going on at the children because of their iPads. They only want what's best for them. Could it be that Jesus goes on and on at them because he cares? Could it be that he's laying it on the line to them because he loves them 
and only wants the best for them and for the people. The confrontations we read about tell us that Jesus is unwilling to give up on the Pharisees or anyone else for that matter. Jesus is unwilling to give up on you and me. At first glance, we might think that there's not a single bit of good news in this parable. Just a jolly good telling off, a parable of exclusion and condemnation. Dare I suggest that if that's the case, we are in danger of missing the point. The good news in today's parable is that it's actually a parable of Jesus' unwillingness to give up. Jesus doesn't want anyone to be excluded from the kingdom of God. He is a God who loves us and only wants the absolute best for each and every one of us, even if that sometimes means a bit of straight talking, a bit of nagging. What, I wonder, is Jesus saying to us today? What is he saying to you? What is he saying to me? Is there something in our lives that needs attention? If so, you can guarantee that Jesus won't give up on us. He'll keep bringing it to our minds until we do something about it. May God open our ears to his word and help us to listen and to act that we might truly share in the kingdom of God here on earth. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in God. I ask, do you believe in God? I believe in God the Father who made me and all the world. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to this earth to be my Saviour. He died for my sins on the cross, rose again from the dead, ascended to the Father in heaven, and will come again in his glory to judge as the judge of all people. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, whom God gives to all who trust in Christ. He makes me more like Jesus, guides and strengthens me in my daily life, and helps me to serve God in the family of the Church. Let us pray for the Church and for the world, and let us thank God for his goodness. Gracious God, whose hand is always upon us, who always knows what's best for his children, we reach out to you in faith as we bring you our prayers, spoken and unspoken. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church in every part of the world as it worships and serves you. Help her always to remain faithful to you to understand your teaching and to listen to you as you speak to us through your word and through your Holy Spirit. We pray for Bishop Michael, Archdeacon Matthew, soon to be our new Bishop of Stafford, and all who seek to serve you. We pray for all in our benefice at Cheddleton, Horton, Longsdon and Rushton. Bless and guide all the leaders in your church, teachers and pastors, preachers and evangelists, that through their ministry and through our ministry, your people may be built up in faith and love. We ask you to give guidance to all who are involved in finding a new priest to lead us in our benefice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world in which we are called to serve, the world for whom you died, remembering the needs of those who are overwhelmed by life and the circumstances surrounding them. 
victims of disaster, injustice, inhumanity, war, aggression, and coronavirus. Bless and guide our own country and the nations of the world, that we may be willing to confront evil and corruption, and give us courage to uphold the standards of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our families, friends and loved ones, naming before you those in particular need as a result of illness, bereavement, sadness or confusion, especially those whom we know who need your gentle touch, those whom we lift to you in a moment of quiet. Give them strength to endure and the confidence to believe that you will bring them through into renewed joy and deepened faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own faith and Christian witness as we seek to bring your love to those around us. Help us to listen to you. Make us bold to proclaim your good news and faithful in following you. We ask these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we come to the end of our service today. We say together, God of our salvation, accept all we offer you this day. May we learn to bear witness to the gospel of your Son, both in word and deed. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.